Hey guys, and welcome to the first lore video in what will hopefully be a series of lore videos on Total War Free Kingdoms. So I thought for the first video of our lore series, we'd look into one of the most prominent characters in the trailer and who's kind of setting in motion the events we're likely to see in the game, and that is Dong Zhao. Now, Dong Zhao is looking like to be the main antagonist in the game. His rise to power sets into motion basically the end of the Han Dynasty, but obviously that is predated by the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which also had an effect on the end of the Han Dynasty and the rise of the different warlords and into the Three Kingdoms. So we're going to take a step back and obviously I'm going to tell you guys how this happened, what the situation is in China and where things go and how does Dong Zhao's story end in real life. Now remember, I'm going to have to be taking I, the story from the historical information we have and Romance of the Three Kingdoms. From what we can tell from the trailer, I'm expecting them to kind of use elements from the F Romance of the Three Kingdoms book, which is slightly different sometimes to history. So we're kind of going to be using both of them, so do apologize if I mix things up here and there between the historical and the book, but it sounds like they're probably going to be using ideas from both, which does make sense. Now, Dong Zhao was born in the province of Gangzhou. In modern times, we'd call it Gangzhou. But in his young days, he was a soldier, a general. He led men, and he wasn't too bad at it, actually. During his time as a general, he experienced many promotions and demotions. He kind of had a mixed experience as a general, though he did show a lot of ingenuity in many campaigns. For example, during the rise of the Yellow Turbans um, underneath the Han Dynasty. Now, the Yellow Turban Rebellion is an important thing for us to talk about when it comes to the lead up of Zhong Zhao taking power. So, to talk about that, we need to talk about the state of affairs in China. Now, at this point in China, China is united as one nation underneath the Han Dynasty. But the Emperor shall we say, is an overindulger. He loves women, he loves food, and the finer things in life. And he's willing to sell basically any titles to anyone who's willing to pay for them. This means that most of the people throughout China start losing faith in the Han Dynasty. You know, the poor, the downtrodden, they can see this kind of corruption going on in the emperor's court. And so when the Yellow Turban Rebellion begins, there's a lot of people, the lower society, willing to join this rebellion. Um, this rebellion was led by a man who, shall we say, in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms especially, he seems to say he has some magical qualities of a spiritual nature. And so the people rally around him. Many young warriors go to the cause of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, with grand ambitions and ideas, and youthful vigor as well. And of course, you could always tell who they were due to the fact that they wore yellow turbans. So yellow was the sign of that you were a man of the rebellion. So of course, the emperor had to put these down. He sent his warlords and generals to try and put down these rebellions, extinguish the flame of revolt. And in the end, they were successful. But a lot of people died. you got to remember, China is a massive country. And when there's a civil war or just even a rebellion, a lot of people are going to die. Um, it's just the sad state of affairs just because, you know, one fire can spread so quickly throughout China and rally a lot of men. And the warlords go in and they take them down and try and gain control back of the land. This allowed many distinguishing people to kind of get themselves recognized, obviously. Um, some people like Yuan Shao, Cao Cao, they would fight in these rebellions. If you read Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei and his colleagues Guan Yu and Zhang Fei kind of get involved. And Sun Jian, a lot of them start to get noticed during these campaigns. So the Yellow Turban Rebellion 
is distinguished by the warlords, but the people are still restless, and that's important to keep in mind. They've lost faith in the Han dynasty, and that's an important element to the end of the Han dynasty, and then obviously what happens next. So the emperor, Emperor Ling, he dies not really long after the Yellow Turban Rebellion, and he leaves the takeover as Emperor Emperor Shao, who is only 13 years old. So having a young emperor obviously is never good. Um, even at 13 years old, he's too young really to take control of the courts and maybe do what needs to be done. So instead, we kind of end up with a regency of his mother and her, his mother's brother, or I think it was half-brother, He Jin. Now, He Jin is the general-in-chief, and him and his mother basically control the court. Now, the court in China can be quite complicated. You have the different warlords, the families, and, of course, the eunuch factions. Um, now, you might be wondering, obviously, some people maybe don't know much about Chinese history. Why are there lots of eunuchs in the emperor's courtroom? Now, the reason for this is because a eunuch, in some ways, people say, is useful for an emperor because they're less likely to betray them. This is because, obviously, the eunuchs do not have a penis. So this means that the eunuchs don't really get married, they don't make family, they have no kids to inherit anything. So this means the likelihood for them to betray is smaller than maybe for a normal man. A normal man might betray the emperor for love, he might betray him for money, he might betray him for his dynasty, you know, his own kids possibly, to pass on to them something. But I mean, if you're a eunuch and you get given lots of money to, let's say, betray the emperor, someone goes, here, have lots of money, now betray the emperor, what are you going to do with that money as a eunuch? You're already in the court of the emperor, so you've probably already been treated not too badly. Um, you're not going to be able to give that money to your kids. You can't give any inheritance to your kids because you're not going to have kids. You can't use it to get women because you, you, you can't really have that either. So really, it does allow for the emperor to trust them um, more than maybe other people. And this obviously in certain historical times in China has led to problems when eunuchs get particularly powerful due to their relationship with the emperor because obviously the emperor feels they can trust them more than other people. But it does make them an important faction in the court. So with the young emperor, um, Emperor Shao, there ended up being kind of um, a fight between He Jin, um, the brother of the mother of the emperor, and the eunuch factions. They were all trying to vie for the power of the court of the emperor and to have more control over him and what goes on. This would then lead He Jin to demand his sister to execute the eunuchs. Um, the mother of the emperor was kind of on the side of the eunuchs. The eunuchs were trying to use her to maybe influence the emperor more, but He Jin was not taking any of it. He was not allowing the units to take control of the court, and so he demanded that she execute them. Now, the eunuchs managed to find out about this. Of course, you know, as you do in politics and intrigue, they had many spies. So you can see it's starting to become very sort of Game of Thronesy. And so the eunuchs decided to devise their own plot before he Jin maybe is able to convince his sister to get rid of them. Obviously, at the, so far, he's not been able to convince her. But just in case he could, and the fact he went so far as to demand their execution, they obviously knew they had to take drastic actions. So they decide to divide, to devise their own plot. They invite He Jin to the court, saying that his sister wants to see him. And when he comes into the court, he is then killed by the eunuchs. And that is the end of He Jin. So He Jin is then killed. But this creates even more problems because the eunuchs obviously have now just killed He Jin. He Jin does have a lot of allies. So, for example, before they assassinated him, he had called upon the warlord in the west. So, just west of the capital, Luoyang, there was Dong Zhao, who had managed to rise up during the Yellow Turban Rebellions, you know, doing some great performances. In particular, there was one battle, if I remember correctly. It could have been before Yellow Turban Rebellion, but I remember he, there was a certain revolt in his area, 
And all the armies that went to fight, his was the only one that survived. So they didn't win that battle, but his army was the only one to survive due to his ingenuity. So he'd managed to rise up the ranks, and he Jin decided to ask him to come to the capital to help him take care of the eunuchs. So Dong Zhao brings his armies from Liang province, and Liang province is a very capable province. It's a very useful province for him to have due to the fact it's only west of the capital. Um, and it's a strategically good position. It's not surrounded by many other provinces. So it's a very good position for him to be in. So He Jing invites him to court to help him deal with the eunuchs. Dong Zhao's forces march towards the capital and then He Jin is killed. Uh, the eunuchs then try to abduct the emperor to try and you know, basically save themselves. So they take the emperor and take him out the capital. But before they can get anywhere, they're intercepted by Dong Zhao. So now you find yourself, you know, if you're Dong Zhao, you've been called to obviously the capital to help the general in chief to deal with the eunuchs. You then find a group of eunuchs with the emperor. You capture them. You get to the capital and He Jin is dead. And a lot of the eunuchs are killed by those that support him, such as Yuan Shao and Yuan Shu. They were supporters of He Jin, and they did not like the eunuchs. And obviously with his death, um, a lot of the eunuchs were executed and killed. So now we have a massive power vacuum. You have a young emperor now with... Ner his mother obviously is still there, but her brother is dead. The eunuchs have no power anymore. Most of them are dead. And Dong Zhao is kind of uh, marched in with an army. It, it's not a good sign. So he's now got his army in the capital and he marches in with the emperor. So obviously Dong Zhao, being the man that he is, decides that this is the perfect time to take advantage, which of course it is. He brings his armies in, he tries to put things stable again, and he decides that he wants to change the emperor. He decides that the emperor's younger family member, um, emperor, who will be called Emperor Xi'an, he is a better choice. Now the reason he wants to do this, obviously, is by choosing an even younger emperor, it's going to be even easier to manipulate and control him. So Dong Zhao is hoping to fill the power vacuum and take control of the court for himself. Now to begin with, certain people reject this, such as Ding Yuan. Um, he refuses to cooperate with this idea to replace the emperor, and Dong Zhao uses his man Lu Bu. Now Lu Bu is an important man, if you're going to talk about Dong Zhao. Dong Zhao is the cruel tyrannic, fat um, monster. He is an ambitious man, willing to do anything that needs to be done, and he seems to take joy in cruelty, as we see in the future. But Lu Bu is one of his most capable soldiers. Lu Bu, in this time period, becomes known as a renowned warrior who could take on hundreds or thousands of men on his own. Men run at the mere sight of him. He is basically a beast in men's clothing. And he is the shadow of Dong Zhao. Wherever Dong Zhao goes, Lu Bu goes with him and strikes down anyone who would speak against him. So Ding Yuan speaks out against him in the court, and so Dong Zhao has Lu Bu kill him. So you can see what's going on right now. You've got all these men in the court, obviously some very powerful men and warlords at the court, but they now find themselves with a man who's marched into the capital, with his own army, and he's now forced him to do what he says. And he gets what he wants. They replace the emperor with Emperor Xi'an. After this as well, Dong Zhao actually adopts Lu Bu as his adopted son. So Lu Bu is now basically his son-in-law. So you can see the connection here. Them both together, they are inseparable. And anyone that would be willing to speak out against Dong Zhao will have to face Lu Bu, which is not a good prospect for any of the ambitious men and women who uh, are in the court. Uh, he also decides to use many plots and intrigue to try and 
keep his power upon the court. Um, if I remember correctly, he does something where basically he has his armies march into the city. Then at night, he has lots of his men secretly leave the city. And then the next day, they march back in, making it appear to the other warlords that he has far more men than he actually does. <laughs> so with things like these different schemes and fear, so with schemes and fear, he gains complete hold over the palace and court. And with now the emperor being younger and more easy to manipulate, um, he decides to declare himself the chancellor of the emperor. And he even goes as far to give himself special privileges. Um, at basically acting as though he is now the ruler rather than the emperor. He kind of dismisses the emperor in ways and just does whatever he wants. Now, when I say he gives himself special privileges, um, we're told that what he does is things, for example, like this. He gives himself the permission to be able to have a sword in the emperor's court. Now, that, that's a big deal when you think about it. In the emperor's court, no one is allowed a sword for obvious reasons. Someone could then assassinate someone else or the emperor. But allowing himself to be able to have a sword in the emperor's court means that if anyone tries anything on him, you know, maybe someone sneaks in a weapon, tries to assassinate him, they know he already has a sword so he can defend himself. If you displease him, maybe, or go against him, maybe he'll use that sword on you. There's nothing you can do. When you enter the emperor's court, you are entering his domain. He can do whatever he wants, basically. He even, in a, it might seem like a small act, he even allows himself to be able to wear his shoes in the court. Now, that might seem like a small thing, but remember, it's all about respect. You know, by not taking off his footwear when he enters the court of the emperor, it's kind of a disrespect towards the emperor. There are even rumors that he would sleep in the emperor's bed, because obviously the emperor had a nice bed, and he would sleep with the palace maids. So basically, you now have this man going around the court, doing whatever he pleases to whoever he pleases. And many of the warlords obviously hated him. Most of the men of the court hated him. He did have his own supporters, especially those that were from Liang province and his own generals and confidants. But many of them hated him. And Dong Zhao knew this. He knew this, but it didn't matter. He had the power and he had Lu Bu. No one was going to, be able to stand against him at court. So you now have this very bad situation for most other people throughout China. So unsurprisingly, this would then lead to a coalition of warlords to rise up against Duong Zhao. This would include Yuan Shao, uh, Yuan Shu, Cao Cao, and Sun Jian. And especially in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Lu Bei and his sworn brothers. So this was kind of their time to shine. They got together, they put their armies together, and they decided to put down Dong Zhao once and for all. Now Yuan Shao obviously was a very, well, I say obviously, many of you might not know, he was from a very distinguished family. The Yuan family were very distinguished and very respected. So him leading the coalition was kind of important to hold it together. You gotta remember, guys, even though they're trying to fight to take down this basically a tyrant who's manipulating and controlling the emperor, they themselves all have their own ambitions, wants, and needs. And none of them really trusted each other. So you've got kind of a lot of people who are working together, who don't like each other, trying to take down another man they just hate more. And that's the situation we're in. Now, historically, when they go to attack the capital of Luoyang to try and take down Dong Zhao, uh, Sun Jian is one of the main combatants, one of the main generals in the forefront of the battles, fighting men like Lu Bu and Dong Zhao's other subordinates. But if you go in the Three Kingdoms, um, a lot of it is also done by Lu Bei and Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. In fact, as you saw in the trailer, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei fight Lu Bu in battle. Um, it comes, if I remember correctly, it comes out, I think they are beating Lu Bu and he retreats. 
if I remember correctly. And you get the famous lines if you've ever played the Dynasty Warriors games of, oh, It's Lubu! It's, I don't, that always just makes me smile, just that whole thing. So it, with this attack on the capital of the Ouyang, Dong Zhao is in trouble. At first, maybe he felt he could hold them off, maybe, but it starts to turn against him. He can't defeat Sun Jian. Sun Jian is just too strong. And obviously, I say that's historical. Romance of the Three Kingdoms, maybe, will be Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and all the other characters. So, he decides to retreat to his province, Liang province. This makes sense, obviously, because by going back to his province, it's his stronghold. He has a lot of support there. So, he retreats to the west and goes to Chang An, which I think in modern times would be known as Xi'an. Um, which obviously is famous for having the terracotta warriors, if I remember correctly. Um, that should be there. But when he moves, he takes the emperor and the court with him. So that way he still has control of the emperor. you got to remember, holding the emperor means you have the power, really. So he takes the emperor and the court and forces them to move to Chang'an in the west. But when he does this, he shows even more cruelty. He decides to basically burn the palaces of the capital of the Ouyang and also ransack the tombs of the former emperors for any money he can find. You know, he's ruthless. He needs to do anything he can to win. If he loses, it hits his head, and he knows that. And there's also stories of how he treated the, um, the people of the city. Some very horrible stories as well as his enemies. There were stories of when his men would capture enemies and prisoners, that they would maybe, people who went against him, he would boil them alive during a meal, like a meatball. Um, yeah, some uh, pretty horrible stories about him and how he treats uh, certain people. So he retreats back to Chang'an, and in so doing this, the allies find the capital, and it's basically gone. Nothing's there. The palace is destroyed. There's nothing really to keep them there, so they have to retreat. This then obviously leads to a bit of a stalemate. So the Allies technically win that first battle, you would say, because they forced Dong Zhao to retreat. But he still holds all the cards. He has the Emperor, he has the court, and now he's retreated back to a place where maybe he feels a bit more secure. And from this position, he decides to send out his generals, men like Li Zhu, um, I cannot pronounce these names, uh, Guo Shi and Zhang Ji. He sends them out to the east to fight in the lands of his enemies of the coalition. And so they start attacking and raiding different provinces, kidnapping people, raiding and pillaging. It's not a good sight. And the allies have difficulty in fighting this. Partly due to the fact, obviously, that there are many different generals trying to work together and they have internal conflicts. Uh, Yuan Shao, Yuan Shu, Cao Cao, Sun Jian, they find it difficult to agree. They're really very different men, and they all have their own ambitions. This allows Dong Zhao's men to basically take advantage of this and do as they please, and it leads really to the end of the coalition. The coalition kind of falls apart, and the generals just can't agree with one another. Let's say in the future we'll do specific videos on those certain characters, so you can get an idea of their different personalities. But from this point on, Dong Zhao is able to consolidate his power even more. He now has, like I say, the courts and the emperor in his lands of Liang province. So this then leads to his reign of terror. So now that he has control, he's not so worried about the coalition. Um, he can now just do as he pleases, and this leads to his tyranny and his horrific crimes against anyone that come against him with Lu Bu as his protective shadow. Wherever he goes, Lu Bu goes with him. And no man is going to challenge Lu Bu to one-on-one -on -one fight. There's only a few men in China who could maybe fight Lu Bu, such as Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. And even then, they fought him together. Sun Jian is a pretty amazing general as well. And historically, you might say he was a better general than Lu Bu, but Lu Bu was more of a fighter, they say, apparently. Now, obviously, he still has his enemies. Even though he has the court with him, remember, the court, people obviously still hate him. They can still see his tyranny and his cruelty, and they obviously want to, some of them, to free the emperor, 
or some of them may have their own ambitions, but with Lu Bu and his schemes, no one could get close to him. With his power, no one could get anywhere close to him, so not many people were willing to try to take him down until the interior minister, Wang Yun. Now, this story here obviously comes a lot from Romance of the Three Kingdoms, though it's very similar historically to what happens, but there's one main element, and that is Wang Yun's um, adopt... I guess he's a, an adopted daughter in a way, Diao Chan. Now, Diao Chan is quite famous throughout China. Um, if you mention her name to most people in China these days, they will recognize that name. She's one of the one of the beauties of Chinese history. Apparently, she was extremely beautiful. And so Wang Gung decided he needed to stop this, and he would use his adopted daughter. She was a song girl who was in his household, but he treated her basically like a daughter, and he decided that there was only one way to get rid of Dong Zhao. You can't get rid of Dong Zhao with his greatest advantage, and that's Lu Bu. So the only way to get rid of Dong Zhao is to get rid of Lu Bu. But how do you get rid of Lu Bu? So Wang Yun decides to use Diao Chan. He invites Lu Bu to, a, shall we say, a meal. He invites Lu Bu for tea and a meal, and he has Diao Chan serve them. Now, because of her beauty, Lu Bu just, he couldn't keep his eyes off her. He was instantly, basically, enthralled by her. And Wang Yun decided to use this to his advantage, and he promised Lu Bu that he would marry his beautiful daughter to the great warrior Lu Bu. And so Lu Bu, of course, felt this was a great idea, and he accepted. Now, he said he'd marry him in the future. Not, not right then, obviously. He said he'd marry his daughter to him in the future. Now, a few days later, maybe, I'm not sure how long later it was, he decides to repeat this on Dong Zhao. He invites Dong Zhao to his home, has Diao Chan serve them wine, sing a song, play music, and has Dong Zhao also enthralled by her. And so Dong Zhao decides that he should take her as his concubine. Now, Wang Yun, being you know, just the interior minister, you know, he's an important man, but he can't go against Dong Zhao, so he says, fine, and he gives Diao Chan to Dong Zhao, but this is exactly what he wants. He wanted both men to be enthralled by her to kind of create this love triangle to destroy the relationship between both of these men, between man and, well, father and adopted son, I guess we could say. So Dong Zhao takes Diao Chan, and obviously Lu Bu finds out about this. And you could imagine he's, he's not a happy fella. He was promised, basically, the girl of his dreams. One of the most beautiful girls in the whole of China during this time period, apparently. If you believe Romance of the Three Kingdoms, everything's always done like that. And so he goes to Dong Zhao's quarters, and he sees her in his home, basically you know, making herself look pretty while Dong Zhao sleeps. And so Diao Chan plays up the situation. She decides to make Lu Bu think that she is in distress and she hates the situation she's in. And she cries. So she cries, she kind of wipes away the tears and maybe looks towards him. And this hits Lu Bu in the heart. He can't believe that Dong Zhao has taken the one thing that he wants. And so this creates a lot of tension between the two and starts to divide them. Slowly and slowly, Lu Bu starts to become more agitated with Dong Zhao, and Diao Chan keeps playing up her sadness to Lu Bu, and the fact that she does not want to be with Dong Zhao. She would rather be with someone like him, maybe. And so this all ends with Wang Yung starting to inflame the seeds of Lu Bu's anger towards Dong Zhao. He kind of inflames his displeasure towards him, and subtly, he persuades Lu Bu to kill Dong Zhao. Now, really, for Lu Bu, he's doing this really more for Diao Chan, but also, he's maybe becoming more displeasured with Dong Zhao and his kind of arrogance, and he doesn't care how Lu Bu feels. So that sets in motion the assassination of Dong Zhao. Now, in the historical text, 
you probably wouldn't say Diao Chan was real. I say obviously these events are still debated today. Um, so we're not exactly sure obviously what happened. But there was an assassination led by Wan Yun and Lu Bu was involved. Whether Diao Chan was real, whether there was a love triangle, is probably probably just a fic, fic, fictitious event written into Romance of the Three Kingdoms and make it seem a bit more romantic and more epic. So the conspirators, they sent a man to fetch Dong Zhao from his protective castle under the idea, under the pretense, that the emperor was intending to abdicate the throne to him. So this is, this is what Dong Zhao has always wanted, obviously. He's wanted to manipulate the emperor until the emperor would be willing to just give up and abdicate and allow him to rule in his steed. And so obviously, Dong Zhao races off to the emperor to uh, get his, well, I guess maybe he would see as his just rewards. But when he gets there, obviously, he's not allowed to take in his troops and stuff, and uh, he doesn't think anything of it. As he enters the palace, um, he's escorted by Wang Yun's loyal soldiers, and they set up the trap where a general stabs Dong Zhao, injuring him in the arm. Now, Dong Zhao, of course, instinctively cries out for Lu Bu. Lu Bu, help me, save me, destroy this fool. But Lu Bu instead turns to him and impales him, apparently, through the throat with his Hal beard, proclaiming, I have an imperial decree to slay the rebel. And so that ends Dong Zhao's life. Now, as I say, this is more the Romance of the Three Kingdoms events for this last part of his assassination. Um, but Lu Bu is definitely involved. And so you can see here, Dong Zhao relied upon Lu Bu to help him keep control of the courts and protect him. And so by them, you know, Wang Yun using Lu Bu against him, there was no way Dong Zhao could get out of this. His greatest weapon became his biggest weakness in the end. Um, if you take the historical accounts, apparently, um, he's actually killed in the street, I think. Like, in, in one of the kind of open streets, he is assassinated. But in this again, Lu Bu kills him again with the final stab of the weapon. And apparently... They set alight his navel, I think they said. They, they set on light his navel and left his body in the street to burn. And anyone who tried to remove it or move the body would be executed. And some people tried um, and were actually executed after. But apparently the fat from him, he had so much fat and oil in his body, the fire lasted for days. Ugh, that... Yeah, that, that paints you a nice little picture there. So, yeah, Dong Zhao, cruel, tyrant, and fat. He was definitely an interesting man who had a very quick rise to power and was, you know, did some very good things. He was very capable at what he did, and he was able to get good men around him to do as he wanted, um, such as his close generals like Guo Shi, Lu Jiu, and, of course, Lu Bu. But his reliance upon Lu Bu ended in his demise and ended the tyranny of Dong Zhao. But this would have massive repercussions on the rest of the realm. Obviously, this would lead to a power vacuum happening once again. After his death, he still had loyalists such as um, um, Liu Ju, Li Ju, yeah, Li Ju, Guo Shi. Zhang Ji and Fan Chao. These loyalists would escape into the province, Liang province, and obviously the head of the snake has been killed, but the actual faction of Liang province is unscathed. So this means the armies, the generals are still all there. So these guys raise up a massive army and decide to go and attack uh, Chang Ang to try and take back the emperor and regain the court for their faction. Now, Chang'an obviously can't defend itself very well. Lu Bu tries to defend the capital, apparently, but he's unable to defeat um, Dong Zhao's loyalists, and so he has to escape. Now, Lu Bu in Romance of the Three Kingdoms actually escapes with Diao Chan, and he goes on to get many 
shall we say, loyal warriors and great warriors to follow him. But that will be another story. Uh, maybe for another video we'll go into Lu Bu and his character, the people that follow him, and also maybe what happens to him after these events of Dong Zhao's death. But Dong Zhao's loyalists, they retake the capital, they retake the emperor, and they now have control over the court once again. But without Dong Zhao, obviously, there's no obvious leader, really. And this obviously gives the chance for the other warlords to try and push their own ambitions. And that's what leads, obviously, to certain rulers gaining lots of power and becoming the free kingdoms. So his decisions and his events do have massive repercussions. And right now, his loyalists control the emperor. What goes on from then? Like I say, we'll find out next time. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I say this is just a, a brief, <laughs> I like to say brief, because I try to keep this as short as possible. I didn't want to go too in-depth and stuff for you guys, because I don't know what you guys want. I don't know if some of you want kind of short videos about these different characters. We want really in-depth, really long videos. So this one I tried to keep as short as I possibly could to give you insight into the character of Dong Zhao and the events that happened around him, including the people that happened around him and leading up to his rise to power and his death. I hope you enjoyed. If you would like to see more, please tell me in the comments section. I would love to see some discussions about what are your opinions of Dong Zhao in the comments section. Um, I don't imagine many people are going to say he's a nice man. He, he was not, apparently. But yes, I'll see you guys next time. NG out.